So before I have Gary Kahn up here, I just want to mention something about today's program. Yesterday was January the 27th. It was International Holocaust Remembrance Day, a recognition designated by the United Nations General Assembly in 2005. It memorializes all those lost in the Holocaust and commemorates the date the Auschwitz camp was liberated by the Soviet Red Army. In recognition of this event at Boulder Rotary, I'd like to have Gary Kahn come up and introduce today's speaker. As uh, most of you know, uh, as a, a longtime member of the program, Programs Committee, I've had the honor of introducing literally dozens of speakers to this uh, forum, but uh, never before my big sister, who, uh, Pat Simons, who you'll get to hear from today. Uh, Susan Conley, who was mentioned earlier, I think last year had her brother uh, and introduced him, and I think he might have written a book or something, but, you know, uh, I, I want you to hear from my sister, who also wrote a book. Uh, and her book was uh, about the escape from pre-war Nazi Germany of our father and his uh, younger brother at ages 19 and 20. And uh, in, it, it was in her research for this book that she uh, ran across a lot of very interesting background information that you're going to hear about today that's pretty much unknown to a lot of us who thought we were well informed about the uh, rise of the Nazis in Germany. Uh, my, my, our dad was actually, for most of his adult life, a proud Rotarian, and he and three of his brothers were all World War II veterans. And uh, one of uh, the thing, legacies he left was uh, the service above self ethic. And Pat has uh, adequately demonstrated following in his footsteps here as a, initially a high school teacher and then uh, following that a successful career as a trial attorney. And uh, 20, I think 20, 25 years ago when she retired, she founded a not-for-profit that's in the Rotary tradition of uh, promoting literacy. In, in her case, this organization called Ready Readers uh, it, for the inner city uh, preschool kids in, in St. Louis has given away over a million books and uh, thousands of children's lives have been affected by that. So I am really proud to introduce and share my big sister with you today. Well, thank you, Gary, for introducing me exaggeratedly to the Rotary Club. I want to thank your incoming president, Cassidy, for inviting me to speak to you and for all her help with this talk and with the PowerPoint slides, which she spiffed up, and also Fred for his help with this presentation. As Gary told you, I wrote a book about 10 years ago based on a true family story. And in doing research for the book, I kind of started wondering how did the Nazis, which started out as this little extremist group of anti-Semites, get enough money in just a few years to acquire the power to wage a state-of-the-art world war? A, word, a war that killed an estimated 60 million worldwide, including about 11 million people who were purposely killed in Nazi concentration camps. I decided it would be interesting to follow the money trail, but what I found, of course, is that that's very complicated. There are experts who still spend their lives studying everything I've learned, and I want you to know at the outset, I am not an expert. But so many people have told me they did not know anything about this topic that I began wanting to share the little I have learned. Now I'm including a source list that I used, but there's a lot more information than that. And a lot of it is now accessible online if you personally would like to dig deeper into any aspect of this talk. 
Well, let's uh, put slide one up there. Is that the hyperinflation slide? All right. In 1920, uh, World War I had ended. Germany wanted to be a democracy and they'd elected a president, of course, but their post-war economy was shattered. They couldn't meet their treaty obligations to other European countries to pay reparations. France therefore sent soldiers in and occupied their industrial area in the German Ruhr Basin in 1923 and German hyperinflation got even worse. The government decided that they would get rid of the Reichsmark. They issued some new money with a new name. That helped for a little while, but then mass unemployment and the divide between rich and poor got worse and the whole thing became untenable. Now America and our thriving companies here saw post-war Germany as a very good potential investment. Understandably, we weren't part of the peace treaty, the Versailles Treaty. We weren't owed any reparations. <clears throat> we didn't have to not deal with Germany. And Germany and America had always had close ties before World War I and even at some points during that time. So post-war Germany was a good investment and in the 1920s, our government passed laws and authorized the sale of bonds to Americans, German bonds, to help Germany repay its debts and recover. American banks helped with these authorizations and made about $50 million in money at that time in profits. And always bear in mind when I'm talking about dollar amounts that it, I'm talking about dollar amounts at that time, not the equivalent of today, unless I say otherwise. So at that time, they made about what was then worth 50 million. The German cartels, most of those were the ones that issued the bonds, they got our investors money, but the American investors themselves didn't make much of anything. Now, the United States thought if Germany could pay at least some of its reparations, the country would rebound. So Congress passed the Young Act, which proposed a new kind of repayment plan. And as a result, a group of American and European bankers and businessmen who were already investing in Germany, and some had already been invested during the World War II and World War I era, they got together after years of discussions and they created a new bank called the Bank for International Settlements, which I'll call BIS put the headquarters in Switzerland, which was always supposed to be neutral, even though Switzerland, as we know now, wasn't so neutral in terms of helping the Nazis hide assets during World War II. <clears throat> American financiers were instrumental in forming and running the new BIS bank. Between 1930 and 1945, American financiers and businessmen chaired the board of directors for 11 out of those 16 years. During World War II, an American was sitting as board chair when that bank accepted and dealt with German reparations payments. Those payments were illegal payments consisting of remelted gold stolen from conquered countries and from individuals, including the gold teeth extracted from murdered concentration camp prisoners. In 1933, Palmer Schacht, who was one of the BIS founders for Germany, became Hitler's finance minister and quickly recognized that the Third Reich could rebuild and rearm by issuing bonds again. So with the help of large American banks, the German government and industries kept extending the due dates of their bonds and reoffering them at higher interest rates. That would induce purchasers to hold on to their bonds and buy still more of them. By 1939, when Germany invaded Poland, it had been able to pay for millions of dollars worth of goods and services to rebuild and rearm, and it did it entirely on credit. As usual, banks and big businesses did profit, but many bondholders never saw a return. <clears throat> 
of the American banks, Chase Manhattan, JP Morgan, and Citibank heavily promoted investments in the German bonds. Like Switzerland, where Germany did all its banking, these American banks also illegally seized bank accounts, especially those of Jewish customers, and turned that money over to the Nazis. Some of these seizures occurred before the war, some during it. During the war, Chase defied US law by moving funds of pro-American, pro-German customers, American customers, to German banks, and by accepting funds from Germany on behalf of Americans invested there. But big banks never act alone. It was American big business that enabled the Nazi government to acquire the materials and know-how to make the weapons, vehicles, and planes that made Germany so powerful and World War II so deadly. Of course, we all know that World War II ended 77 years ago and we can't go back. But some of our largest and most prestigious American companies owe their current prosperity to some of their past conduct. We all know past actions inform present conduct and present conduct informs the future. What happened then is relevant now because many of the mechanisms that were in place then are still in place today. So I want to turn to what did happen. That story starts with Henry Ford. We can do slide one. <clears throat> well, not that one, before it. The story of Henry Ford, unless you've already had that up there. There it is. Um, he became, as you know, because of his rags to riches story and his folksy manner and his incredible business savvy, he became a worldwide idol. And when in 1921, the Nazis were nothing but a group of thugs, um, they were publicly getting some publicity for denouncing Jews as the cause of all of Germany's problems. And a couple of war heroes joined them in this. The facts had nothing to do with their claims. German Jews at that time comprised less of seven tenths of 1% of the German population. And German Jews had been wounded and fought and died in the same proportion to the rest of the Germans as everyone else. In fact, my grandfather fought for the Germans in World War I and got an Iron Cross. The problem wasn't that the German Jews weren't patriotic, they were. The problem was the loser needed to blame someone. Anti-Semitism had already been endemic in Europe and especially Germany for 1500 years. So Jews were the logical scapegoat. Henry Ford shared Hitler's views of the Jews. In an interview, he said that Jews had caused all the wars of the world. He told family members that Hitler was right to try to get rid of them. He could think of no one more worthy of his support. Within two or three years of, after the end of the war, the Nazis had a newspaper, a staff, new vehicles, uniforms, and some weapons for their new party members. And they had an office. Hitler showed off a large portrait of Ford in that office. It was a gift from Ford. Ford also kept a picture of Hitler in his office. Hitler also bragged publicly he had Ford's financial support. By 1923, Hitler had enough money to host parades in public, travel, attract crowds, and launch his failed coup to try to overthrow the democratic government. We don't know how much direct financial support Ford actually gave Hitler, but we do know Ford Motors began making and selling vehicles in Germany in 1925, including military vehicles that made the Blitzkrieg possible. More importantly, however, was what Ford did to legitimize anti-Semitism to promote Hitler's war against the Jewish people. First, he published this Detroit newspaper called the Dearborn Independent, its purpose was to spread lies. He did that for 91 weeks and hired people to go gather up the lies all over the country. He also published a book, which he called The International Jew, claiming that Jews were conspiring to take over the world. This, was a, this libel was based on an old novel um, that had first come out in Russian, then French, then German, been revised many times, and 
The New York Times and the London Times had investigated it when it was novel and had thoroughly debunked it. It didn't matter to Ford. His newspapers and books went to car dealers, schools, and libraries everywhere. All over the world, his book was translated into 16 languages. By 1922, there were six editions in Germany by itself. Slide number two, Baldur Schirach. We have the next slide. After the war ended, former Nazi soldiers, many of them in high ranking like this gentleman, um, said it was Henry Ford and not Adolf Hitler who first taught them to hate Jews. Here's what he said, as you see there. I read his book and became anti-Semitic. In those days, these, this book made a deep impression on my friends and myself because we saw in Henry Ford the representative of success, also the exponent of a progressive social policy. In the poverty-stricken and wretched Germany of the time, youth looked toward America and apart from the great benefactor, Herbert Hoover, it was Ford to us representing America. Go to the next slide, please. In 1938, Hitler honored Henry Ford with um, Germany's highest award for civilians, pinned the Medal of Honor on him. Now Ford Motors was not one of the biggest US companies that did business in Germany. So who were the bigger ones? What did they do? In 1942, Congress passed a law. This was because we were now in the war. The law traded, forbid trading with the enemies. Big American countries at the big American companies at that time said they had no control over what their German subsidiary companies did during the war because the German government appointed German custodians to manage subsidiary operations. But actually, most American corporations kept their American board of directors and still made the really critical decisions. How? First, the men who were appointed as custodians were often Germans the parent company had already hired. Second, the US government found no evidence after the war that the Nazi government had taken any American subsidiaries' profits during the war. Third, when the war ended, the German custodians returned the American company's stock and assets and dividends they had been holding in trust. The American parent companies publicly then resumed control. Slide number five. The next one, please. Okay. In 1942 and again in 1945, the US government required American co corporations to report all their German business interests and state what value they placed on them. <clears throat> I located a booklet, which was a, an official 1945 US Department of War pamphlet, rather long. It listed about 120 American companies that did report their German interests, both in 1942 and in 1945. But there were also companies that didn't report. Now, looking through these reports, we can't obviously see them all, but if you look carefully, you'll see some names you recognize, I think. I'm going to only focus on a few. Go to the next slide, please. You see how long this list is, and you can see the number of subsidiary companies that were in Germany for each of these large ones. Well, for example, one of the companies which I'll talk about is General Motors. If you look at one of the pages there, I can hardly see the numbers, but it's the third page. You'll find its name there, you'll find Ford there, and you'll see a list of some of the German subsidiaries. Go to the next slide, please. Fred, can you do the next slide? Maybe it's stuck. <laughs> 
Oh, okay, let me go ahead. Um, this is a this is a picture of a refinery built by Fred Koch, who is the father of Charles and David Koch, the company that was at the time that was in Germany that Fred had it, was one of the ones that did not report to the German government. So it's not listed in that lengthy book, but um, he built this oil refinery Hitler personally approved of. It also used slave laborers during World War II. Next slide, please. In this slide, you can see the top American, top 20, in these next two slides, actually, the top 20 companies in America that had investments in Nazi Germany in 1942 and 1945. All of this information, except the equivalents that I've, I created um, by using calculators on the internet, uh, all those are listed in that booklet I just told you about. So as you can see, um, the equivalents in US dollars were rather enormous. Standard Oil in 1942 had an investment of, what is that? <laughs> yeah. And, um, and then the second most profitable was General Motors. Woolworth was one of the few to pull out as soon as World War II started, but it was making a lot of money there. And then ITT, I mean, International Security Services was next. Go to the next slide. Mm, I don't know. I don't see it. Does everyone else? Here it is. So this shows uh, the next 12 companies or 11 companies, 10 companies, the top 10 as translated, and then 11 through 20 are listed here. And even though um, IBM and Ford and GE weren't among the very top money earners, they were very, very pivotal, pivotal in helping Germany rearm and wage World War II. <clears throat> now, as you can see, if you, if you look through the pamphlet, some corporations said that the values of their German subsidiaries declined during the war. But my research seems to indicate that that's a dubious claim. Why? First, the values they attributed to their own companies were subjectively done, were unverified independently. Second, the US allowed parent companies to deduct as a total loss, the total value that they attributed to German subsidiaries, even if they kept operating, but all but a few did. Third, although the German subsidiaries couldn't declare dividends during the war, <clears throat> as I told you, their wartime dividends and other profits and stock went back to the parent corporation. Fourth, big American companies had multiple interests, as you could see already, and multiple facilities and companies everywhere, not just in Germany. And they continued operating, as usual, during the war, even in Axis countries. Fifth, the same companies that supplied the Nazis with war material also supplied the United States and our allies with that war material during the war, and they profited from that. And sixth, the US government richly compensated some American corporation, parent, parent corporations for losses to their subsidiaries. For example, they were compensated if allied bombs did damage to their European properties. So anyway, I, focus, I can't focus on all of them and I'm going to focus on a few. The most profitable one and the one that helped the Nazi war effort most was Standard Oil. <clears throat> But in order to understand what Standard Oil and its other, other important companies contributed, I first need to tell you about their closest partner. And that was a company called IG Farben, 
In 1920s, Germany was far from self-sufficient. It had very little in the way of raw materials and production capability. But what it did have was a very strong chemical and dye industry, pharmaceuticals, and all of those kinds of things. But American companies had everything else, especially patents and technology with which to produce the latest synthetics of oil, gasoline, rubber, textiles, and nitrates. U.S. companies also had abundant raw materials that were critical, like oil, aluminum, tungsten. Germany didn't have these, and they needed them to make state-of-the-art <clears throat> weapons and vehicles and planes. So in 1925, the large German chemical and dye companies joined with American bankers and businessmen, including Fritz Tyson, who was a German industrialist and an early Nazi supporters. And they formed a company called IG Farben. The name actually stood for words in German, meaning community of interest. The managing board consisted of German and American bankers, and industrialists who helped capitalize IG Farben. Among them were the Rockefellers who owned Standard Oil, Preston Bush and his father-in-law, Herbert Walker, and the Harrimans. Another prominent figure was Fritz Tyson, a German industrialist. To funnel money back and forth between Germany and US industries, IG Farben worked with central banks and new banks, including a new one in New York started by Tyson in partnership with the Bush and Walker families. By 1930, <clears throat> IG Farben and its stakeholders were thriving. This little chart here gives you some example of its operations at that time. With the onset of the Great Depression, German, Germany's economy was collapsed. And um, of course it did. It was so tied into ours, which had just collapsed. There was civil disorder and a lot more support for the party, the Communist Party. Additionally, more Nazis began to be elected to the legislature in Germany. <clears throat> the men in IG Farben knew that the democracy there was in trouble. And business preferred the Nazi promises of law and order to the possible rise of communism and more disorder <clears throat> by the organizing of labor. So in 1932, according to Fritz Tyson, who later took back his support for Hitler, it was a little too late, <clears throat> many industrialists signed a petition asking Hitler be appointed chancellor. Big business also contributed substantially to the Nazi party at that time. Standard Oil, for instance, gave them a donation of $2 million at that time. <clears throat> now in January of 1933, Hitler took power. And right after that, IG Farben, which as I told you was made up of Americans and Germans, donated a large sum to the Nazi party and <clears throat> the Nazi government and the IG Farben agenda became synonymous to wit, to make Germany self-sufficient by rebuilding and rearming the country, regardless of whatever prohibitions there were in that Versailles Treaty. By 1937, IG Farben had doubled in size, thanks in no part to multiple deals with Standard Oil, GM, DuPont, Union Carbide, Alcoa, Dow, and all their many interests. All of these companies also had a lot of US subsidiaries and sister companies. <clears throat> Farben became the fourth largest overall industry in the world after GM, U.S. Steel, and Standard Oil. August von Mieren, a German executive of IG Farben, said <clears throat> after the uh, war ended, he said Hitler's style of war would have been, quote, impossible if the Americans hadn't, quote, presented us with the production plans complete with their know-how, close quote. IG Farben was responsible for the murders of at least a million people at Auschwitz, where it built its own labor camp facility <coughs> and used slave laborers partly to manufacture the gas that killed people. Farben had bought a high percentage of uh, Degesch, a German chemical company, 
that made a disinfectant containing precious acid. That was used in mustard gas in World War I, and the Nazis knew about it, of course, because <laughs> they used it. But it was also used in gas in American gas chambers, and they knew that. They played around with that formula and created a new gas they called Cyclone B. They then sold that to the SS and the German army, and it was mainly used to kill prisoners at Auschwitz. This is a slide here of Farben's concentration camp, which it built near the, near the Auschwitz murder campus. And there you see uh, the label of Zyklon B. And so who were the American shareholders who profited from IG Farben's uh, enormous growth? Next slide, please. <coughs> These are the directors, the American directors of IG in 1930. It says Aniline there, and in a minute I'll explain why. But as you can see by looking, these people were not unimportant people in the United States. IG Farben had an American subsidiary, and the board members of it were Edsel Ford, Walter Teague, H.A. Metz, C.E. Mitchell, and Paul Warburg, who was on the Federal Reserve and the Bank of Manhattan, and W.E. Weiss, who was with Sterling Products, the U.S. pharmaceutical company that had the patent for Bayer aspirin. Among other things, the American IG Farben subsidiary owned half of an Alcoa magnesium company and half of a company that made chemical dyes and synthetics called General Aniline. From 1933 to 1939, the Farben American subsidiary told the SEC and filed reports that it, quote, had no parent company or did not know if it had one. Then in 1939, the American IG Farben merged with the Aniline company and changed its name to General Aniline. This was, of course, the same year that Germany attacked Poland. <clears throat> Farben's American subsidiary in 1939 was worth $11 million in 1939 money, but that was mostly held in standard oil stock. Today's dollars, or actually 1920s dollars, would have made it $207 million in value. I told about Farben because you needed that to grasp the, the role of some of these American companies in creating the Nazi war machine. Not only did Standard Oil help capitalize and grow IG Farben, but it probably did more than any other American company to help make the Nazis make World War II the deadly conflict that it was. The Rockefeller family owned the most shares in Standard Oil. Standard Oil owned the next largest number of shares in IG Farben. Standard Oil also controlled numerous subsidiaries, including German American Petroleum, whose board chairman was actually part of an elite SS group called Circle of Friends, which was formed during World War II to, quote, protect American interests that were active during World War II in Germany. They protected those interests in return for large bribes from the American companies. Next slide, please. From 1933 on, Standard worked hard to get American public support for the Nazi regime. They hired the most prominent New York advertising company, Ivy Lee, to spin the Reich in a favorable light and to advertise and promote Standard Oil's joint ventures with the Nazi government as if they were patriotic acts. This publicity, combined with the anti-Semitic rhetoric of prominent people like Ford, like Charles Lindbergh later, and like a radio celebrity who every week spewed anti-Semitic stuff was, his name was Father Coughlin. This rhetoric didn't hurt the Nazi cause in the United States, and it spread the hatred of Jews and admiration for Hitler's Germany and support for America's isolationist policies 
pro-Nazi support groups in this country drew thousands of people to rallies and marches and even packed Madison Square Garden at one point for a rally. A 1941 investigation of Standard Oil revealed that since 1929, it had had this secret contract with IG Farben in which it had promised not to compete in the world chemistry industry, chemical industry, and in return, Farben had agreed not to compete in the oil business, except in Germany. And there, the um, and there, Standard Oil helped Germany to find its own oil and petroleum resources and create refineries. They also agreed to share their trade secrets when their interests coincided. So throughout the 30s, Standard provided IG Farben with the information to manufacture butyl rubber. This technology let Germany develop tires for heavy war equipment, which it otherwise couldn't have. And when the US entered the war, a congressional investigation determined that Standard had denied US companies access to that very technical information, which caused the shortage of butyl rubber in the United, that the United States needed to wage war. Next slide, please. You have the next slide, here we go. Here are a couple of articles that have to do with finally belated investigations into what Standard Oil had been doing um, to assist the Nazis in their war preparations. There were some fines levied of about $5,000 or some nominal amount for the people that were in charge of all this. Uh, but as you can see, um, what they had done was not helpful to say the least. Standard Oil also built refineries in Germany to produce a new kind of high octane aviation fuel that the Germans had not had. Um, they assigned Farben their patents for a superior method of making explosives as well. They even helped IG Farben pay for the raw materials and chemicals needed to make these products. They did that by discounting prices and by forfeiting bonds that they posted to ensure that Farben, Farben would pay other suppliers. After the war started in Europe, Standard tried to leverage its connection with the Nazis by pushing the United States to let it sell certain Hungarian assets to the Nazis. The Nazis said no, because that would have furthered Germany's plan to dominate Europe economically. But in 1943 and 1944, the Standard Oil German subsidiary, one of them, Sent gave substantial bribes to the SS to protect its interests. During World War II, the US experienced serious shortages of many critical materials, as well as production deficiencies, all because of secret agreements between IG Farben and American businesses. For example, DuPont provided the Nazis with licenses in acrylates, nitro nitrogenous products, nylon, and processes for making Buna rubber. Rubber. Next slide, please. All of these companies use slave labor. Um, the slaves were people that were taken from concentration camps who were healthy enough to work. Um, I won't go into conditions in those camps, but this is a slide of one of DuPont's. Dow Chemical the sole producer of magnesium in the United States purposely limited its production in order to be part of contracts with IG Farben. As a result, German magnesium output in 1939, when the war started, was over five times what the US could produce. The Nazis also bought magnesium from Dow at 21 cents a pound, but charged the United States companies 31 cents a pound for magnesium. Magnesium was critical to airplane production. And, and to making certain incendiary bombs. 
Next slide, please. Alcoa Aluminum's secret deals with IG Farben resulted in a shortage of aluminum, as you can see here, for building America, American planes during the war. I think there might be the ne next slide, an article about GE, perhaps. We'll try the next slide. All right, just leave that one there. <clears throat> From 1929, I, I just also want to talk about GE for one second. GE and the German company Krupp monopolized German trade, US German trade in tungsten carbide, which was another essential tool, metal tool, machine metal tool, and charged the US much more than it charged Germany. And Germany therefore developed a much superior machine tool industry The second top moneymaker in Germany, to American moneymaker in Germany, was General Motors. Hitler's military machine was actually General Motors' largest customer. In 1929, GM bought the German auto company Opel and made it German, a GM's German subsidiary. By 1939, Opel had a workforce of 27,000 and was one of Germany's leading employers. Opel GM provided the Nazi war machine with the technical information and supplies to make the Blitz truck, the main German truck that was used to occupy Europe. And that is responsible for the word Blitzkrieg, lightning war. GM also developed rocket technology, built engines for German bombers, made landmines and torpedo detonators. Ethel Gasoline Corporation, an American company that GM and Standard Oil owned together, also supplied the Nazis with tetraethyl lead, built military manufacturing facilities for the Nazis, and this was in the 1930s, so secretly stockpiled millions of dollars in aviation gasoline for them. Opel had an American board of directors throughout World War II and it helped Germany even after the US declared war, at least twice after the US banned trading with Germany, James Mooney, who is pictured here and was the overseas operator for GM, traveled to Germany where he helped convert the Nazis convert a GM auto plant into an aircraft manufacturing plant that made engines for the bomber that Germany used the most during the war. And like Henry Ford, GM's overseas director received a German Medal of Honor. He, by the way, was required to return that. After the war, the Nazi armaments chief, Albert Speer, said that Germany simply could not have attempted the Blitzkrieg without the technology GM had provided. ITT also played a major role in the Nazi war machine. Next slide, please. The first American businessman to shake Hitler's hand was Sosthenes, and I'm not sure I'm saying his name right, so I'll just call him by Venice. I hope that's right. S-O-S-T-H-E-N-E-S, Venice, V-E-N-E-S of ITT. He, like many of the men we've talked about, were also quite anti-Semitic. This is a slide of the F-O-C-K-E Folk Wolf ITT factory in 1945. While under American control, ITT used at least three German subsidiaries to build German bombers, fighter planes, and radar equipment. During the war, ITT was the single largest shareholder of the German subsidiary that made these things. And Mr. Bennett and a German partner owned the other 75% of that subsidiary personally. ITT also owned an interest in a German company that made radar and related equipment for Germany during the war. None of these interests were ever reported to the government, our government. During World War II, ITT also continued providing patents on techniques to the Nazis that facilitated their economic penetration of other countries. 
Mr. Bennett's, like other American tycoons, also bribed the SS to, quote, protect his company's operations during the war. In fact, in 1943 and 4, ITT's German subsidiaries contributed close to 25% of all the bribes given to the SS. ITT has never been called to account. In fact, in 1962, the ITT gave, I mean, the US gave ITT $26 million in 1962 dollars to compensate it for its share of loss in the bombed aircraft, in its bombed aircraft plant. So in, in, in $2,020, that would be equivalent to $226 million. But of all the American companies that furthered the Nazi regime, I believe IBM did the most to help create the Holocaust. Next slide, please. German companies about racial, German ideas about racial superiority didn't start in Germany contrary to what most of us think or thought. Scientists here in the US were actually studying eugenics theory, racial theory, at the same time that Hitler began preaching his theory of Aryan superiority. <clears throat> he just took it a little bit further. Here in America, the Carnegie Institute began funding eugenics research and experimenting on people who didn't know they were getting experimented on very early in the 20th century, companies run by Rockefeller's family, Standard Oil, you know, as late as 1952 were supporting the American Eugenics Society, 1952. The stated mission of the American Eugenics Society was to stop the spread of non-white people in America. Both before and after World War II, the US government, most Americans and most corporations approved of the Nazis' distaste for communism and agreed with the need for law and order. I would say that's still true today. And I've already talked about Ford and how he popularized the acceptability of hating Jews. In the 1930s, because of Ford, Lindbergh, Father Coughlin and others, it became actually much more acceptable to harbor and publicly voice anti-Semitic ideas. Before that, most of it was hush-hush. One of Germany's first objectives in Aryanizing Germany was to expel all of its Jews. But to do that, Hitler had to know who they were and where they were. This was not obvious because as I told you, they made up less than 1% of the entire population. And most of them happened to be white assimilated and secular, that is not religious. How to identify German Jews? Enter IBM. IBM produced and provided the Nazis with custom-made punch cards. You can see an example of one in, in that slide. To help Hitler's government take censuses, official census, so that the government would know where everyone was and all their identities. These cards were custom made to, to also identify the ancestry of every citizen. Most people in Germany were Catholic or Lutheran. And of course, there were people who were Jews. They were identified on these punch cards that way. Churches and um, other organizations, libraries, official records, places, all cooperated, of course, it was a US government survey that um, to, uh, to give information to them for, um, for these purposes. The punch cards also enabled the Nazis to identify with people who had Jewish ancestors. And those people were labeled Jewish, even if they really practiced a different religion. And even if they had converted, and even if that was even if that was already true for others, in other words, if your grandparent, one grandparent was Jewish, you were identified as a Jew. IBM built, leased, installed, and serviced its equipment in hundreds of locations, including in the vast system of concentration camps. IBM trained and sent servicemen to service its machines, 
and to train people to use them wherever they were. IBM's technology and equipment enabled the Nazis to identify, locate, and transport Jews to ghettos and concentration camps. Its systems and equipment were used to round up Jews in occupied countries to determine when and how many to transport to various locations, to determine which rail lines were available and when, to determine occupancy in camps and other detention areas, and to help schedule forced labor details and executions. For a while, prisoners who were chosen as slave laborers at Auschwitz and its subcamps were tattooed with IBM numbers. On that slide, you'll see one of them. Those numbers corresponded to their IBM punch card numbers. This helped the Nazis know where they were at the time. And of course, the Nazis pinned a medal on Thomas Watson, the CEO of IBM. In 1941, Germany adopted its infamous final solution to kill every Jewish man, woman, and child in Europe. They did succeed in murdering about two thirds of the European Jewish population, which is about 6 million. Could they have done that without IBM's equipment and, top, and technology? I really don't know how, because without IBM, they would have had a much harder time locating, identifying, transporting, and then systematically murdering 6 million people. How much did the American government know about American business involvement in rebuilding and rearming Germany? Well, it was no secret that the Farben cartel was infused with American capital and that prominent American citizens and industrious, industrialists were helping. Germany and Farben never made a secret of what they were doing. The only thing US companies did not know was that, they, that the US would end up fighting with Germany as an enemy in the war. They were so connected to investments that in Germany that many prominent Americans joined them in advocating isolation and neutrality regardless of what was happening in Europe. There were some Americans in Germany sounding alarms and one was William Dodd. Next slide. William Dodd Wright wrote letters asking why over 100 major American companies had big contracts in Europe. And rather than go through all the questions he asked with you, I'll just say he mentioned by name DuPont, IG Farben, Standard Oil, um, the company Krupp. Um, and he said, why is such an, an enormous amount of business being done by German subsidiaries? He told Roosevelt that the activities of the American companies were, quote, adding to war dangers, close quote. And he also complained about German treatment of Jews um, when he refused to stop asking questions and be a better host, he was replaced. Since the war ended 77 years ago, there have been a number of investigations, books, lawsuits, commissions, Funds promised and some established to try to address and redress various and disappointments. Pat, I'm really sorry. We're going to have to bring your talk. Yeah, I'm, I'm ending it now. Um, a few corporations have acknowledged having some role, but mostly they have done as much as possible not to do that. And I think those people that inherit great wealth also inherit great responsibility and we are all as american citizens entitled to a forthright accounting of corporate conduct on which their future prosperity and credibility may depend thank you so much <clears throat> pat i think um that this tells us that we need to take a stand and ask these companies to tell the truth now. In Germany, they certainly required people to do that, and we should stand up too. Very, very thorough job of saying, here's what we did, and we're sorry, and here's how we're going to make amends. In the and other, by the way, Americans weren't the only industrialists involved in all this. I don't mean to imply that at all. 
Germany had support from plenty of countries, plenty of tycoons. But I'm focusing today on the American companies because we are Americans. And I think we need to know. Yes, and thank you. Pat, you may know that um, Rotary is very involved in eradicating polio in the world, and we're very, very close to doing that. And to thank you for this fabulous talk, we at Boulder Rotary are going to contribute 100 doses of polio vaccine to the uh, Polio Plan Fund in your name. And thank you again. Thank you very much.